So thank you for coming today. And a couple of things real quick. If you get a chance, if you haven't already, just kind of sign in, check in, add your name if you need to, uh, grab a lunch if you haven't. It looks like we have plenty. There's drinks. There's baklava fresh from Istanbul this week. So <laughs> I kind of brought it just for you. Uh, but no, help, help yourself to anything back there. And then uh, Jeff is very comfortable with the session being open to questions or comments at any time. And then also there will be plenty of time at the end to have a larger dialogue as well. So feel comfortable making this as much as a conversation as you want to. Jeff is very flexible with that. Hello. Uh, handouts back there. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned that. Handouts. Two handouts. Okay. And then one thing I certainly don't want to, this is, Something I want to look ahead a little bit towards spring is uh, maybe we're talking about doing a session related to teaching unprepared students. And that's not necessarily the, the same issue, but related issues as far as supporting students. So uh, there's a faculty member at Chief of State, Kathleen Gabriel, who's doing some great work in this area. She's been highly recommended, and I've known her for a few years now. I'm thinking of that as being uh, another topic in the spring to talk about that relates to student support. Well, first generation students and yeah, there is there definitely more to But I was but I was trying to say this is just yeah. session. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm yeah, gonna yeah. keep that separate. Uh, anything else, Heather, that you can think to add in? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna go through any announcements and I'm not I'm not gonna say the M word today. Some of you know what that is. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll leave it hanging if you don't. Um, Yes, Moodle. <laughs> we'll just go on to a different whole topic today. And Barbara's going to adjust our lights. Yeah, and I'll just confirm what Brett said. I, mean, I'm, I have no problem and actually encourage any questions at any time, you know, with any insights you might have to add to what I'm saying or to um, um, inject a different uh, uh, point of view or anything like that. Um, uh, uh, first, I'll introduce myself a little bit. I, I am the director of what we call the Learning Center at Sonoma State, and one of the units in the Learning Center is the tutorial program, which is open to all Sonoma State students. Um, and um, it's getting more and more robust here. I'm very happy about that because I think tutoring um, is extremely important to Sonoma State students, and many of them. Uh, don't succeed in your in your classes very well unless they get that kind of extra support. I'm talking about all Sonoma State students. The other programs in the Learning Center are what are called uh, TRIO projects. Um, TRIO is a funding body uh, that supports a number of different kinds of projects. Most people are familiar with Upward Bound. They've heard of Upward Bound, and most and probably many of you know what Upward Bound does, which is um, takes non-traditional students, uh, high school students, and supports them and uh, in the context of having them uh, enroll in post-secondary institutions, community colleges, and foreign institutions. We actually have four professional programs that are hosted by Sonoma State. Um, there's also a, what's called a talent search project, which goes down to the middle school that supports these same students. I say there is, TRIO also funds that. It's a different kind of project, but it goes all the way down to middle school. Um, TRIO also supports what are called student support service projects, and those are the projects that are hosted by uh, community colleges and four-year institutions that support non-traditional students who are enrolled in um, uh, post-secondary institutions. Uh, and we, we call our student support service project Learning Skills Services here, and many of you know the kind of work that's that's going on there. Three years ago, we won uh, what's called the McNair Scholars Project, which is another different kind of trio project. And that project um, takes 25 or so of our highest achieving undergraduates at Sonoma State and uh, puts them in a program of support to assist them enroll, uh, apply to and enroll in graduate school. So it assists un underrepresented uh, non-traditional students um, enroll in graduate schools, and so we have that as well. So sometimes when I talk to people, and in some of the writing I do, uh, I suggest we have the whole trio pipeline here in Sonoma State. I'm kind of proud of that, actually. We can take, um, you know, a seventh grader 
and um, support that seventh grader, encourage that seventh grader, perhaps to apply to a graduate program, perhaps even a PhD program, and, and um, uh, add to the, the effort uh, in the United States to to have more underrepresented folks in the U.S. professoriate, which, as I think many people know, still is a little underbalanced um, in terms of um, certain kinds of folks achieving PhDs. And um, having that kind of status, becoming a professor, and then influence American, American culture that way. And, I know I'm going a little on and on, but I'm kind of proud of this, just this last you know, two months ago, we found out we won another TRIO Student Support Service Project, which is going to add $220,000 per year to the Learning Center uh, to support um, um, Sonoma State's multilingual learners. Uh, so this is another TRIO Student Support Service Project of the kind that Learning Skill Services is here, but it is specifically, that money specifically here, Mark, for um, multi multilingual learners, and we're in the process of setting that up, and hope to be providing services in the spring. So, I began at Sonoma State uh, 10 or 11 years ago as adjunct faculty in the English department, and in that, doing that work, uh, uh, learning skills services became known to me. I didn't know what Trio was before that time. Um, I became interested in the work. Uh, they were doing, and I uh, became employed by Learning Skills Services, and a couple of years later became the director of Learning Skills Services. Uh, Learning Skills Services, by the way, is the jewel in the crown. That's been here since uh, 1968, I believe, in Sedona State. These grants are, they, they must be renewed now every five years, but um, you kind of have to not know what you're doing. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> projects up for renewal here pretty soon, but um, we're, we're going to get it renewed. Um, but the, these, these things are, uh, if you know what you're doing, they're mainly permanent fixtures of the institution. And I have to say, Sonoma State has been extraordinarily supportive of the TRIO projects. And, and many of you who know me and have worked with me, uh, and this happens all the time, um, when I tell them, oh yeah, we have to rewrite every five years, they're surprised because Learning Skill Services is just kind of a fixture of the institution has been here way longer than any of us in the room, um, and hopefully it always will be. Uh, anyway, so that's how I ended up at Learning Skill Services, and um, during, you know, I don't know, it's been five years ago, one of the projects that we, uh, I thought would be a valuable thing to do would be to um, contact some of our students and have them uh, write their stories of um, matriculating at Sonoma State as a first generation student. Um, and so we put together uh, a support network of uh, an editor who helped, uh, I think we started with about 20 students, um, and that person helped these students uh, edit and fashion their narratives and uh, they did a beautiful job, and we, and we, out of the 20, we came up with 14 fully blown narratives, all of Sonoma State students who were describing the experience of being a first generation student at Sonoma State. Um, and they turned out so well, the idea was to have the narratives, maybe put them up on the website and, and, and let people know that this is, this is what it's like to be at Sonoma State. Uh, actually, we never even did that. We're still shooting. <laughs> but what happened was that core caused me to be even more interested in that first generation student experience. And so I got even more immersed in the, in the literature and in the research on first generation students. And so I was doing that work and said, oh, put these things together, the narratives and uh, my survey of the literature. And we produced a uh, self-printed, the, the project printed up about a thousand um, precursors to the book, and we distribute them. We distribute them on the campus, and we put try to put one in every um, faculty member's box. And some of you may remember that it's a bigger format than this. Um, and that turned out so well. I said, "I'm going to send this around to publishers." And sure enough, uh, Stylus uh, picked it up by on the basis of um, um, that original 
uh, self-printed volume. Um, and in conjunction with the uh, America, uh, ACPA, American College of Personnel Association, one of the two big student affairs uh, professional associations, uh, um, um, published the volume. So, uh, and that happened, as Brett mentioned, last spring. So, that is how I personally have gotten interested in this thing that I call the first generation student experience. Um, and uh, this, uh, the last thing I'll say about that is uh, the, the publishers wanted, and I wanted, to do about 75% more text that was in that original volume. So, if you hold on to that other one, oh, you gotta get the new one. <laughs> a lot more good stuff in there. Uh, but the original 14 narratives are the same. And I, and I still say when I talk about it, they are the core of the book. Um, and they are very interesting to read. Um, there are first year students. Uh, I think there are one or two graduate students. There are students belonging to ethnic minority groups. There are white students. They're just, they're all over the map. But when you, when you read through the 14 narratives, you really see a core experience going on. They all have a very similar profile when you, when you actually look at the words they're saying. So that's how uh, this book was produced. Um, since that time, um, I have been, uh, as Brett suggested, doing other work with speaking engagements. And uh, on Tuesday, I was in Madison, Wisconsin, putting together a national broadcast webinar that people subscribe to. Um, and uh, that is a, is a further description of first generation student connected to the book. So uh, that's how this uh, uh, PowerPoint was produced, and why this PowerPoint was produced. Before we actually get into some of the, the details, uh, well, well, before we get into some of the details, I would like to put this uh, presentation of the first generation student experience into at least two other contexts outside the book itself. Uh, one is, uh, what what some people are describing, and you uh, you've probably heard this terminology, it's coming to be becoming more and more common. Uh, some what some people are calling where we are right now in post-secondary education nationally, people are talking about it as being the success era. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean what you think if you're not familiar with this term. The the that, that term the success era is meant in distinction from the previous era, which is regarded as the access era in post-secondary education. And folks who uh, um, subscribe to this terminology, like I do, um, suggest that the access era in post-secondary education began with the, the GI Bill and the Higher Ed Act of 1965 and other public policy that allowed um, different kinds of Americans to have access to a college uh, education. Prior to that point, I think mo most of us would agree, um, there, there was a fairly limited slice of the American population that really had access to a higher education. Um, and so the access, the term access in the access era refers to this opening up of uh, the American post-secondary ed education system that allowed um, Getting women, of course, um, more access to uh, um, a higher education. Certainly, folks belonging to ethnic minority groups. Um, more recently, folks with disabilities um, are all um, attending uh, um, college or university now because of this access era. Um, now, folks might be thinking, is he suggesting that the access era is over? No, we don't really want to say that because although a lot of gains have been made, and I think in many ways, you know, we as a country can be proud of those gains, um, there's still, I don't think yeah, all of us would agree, uh, the, as far as easy access goes to a, to a uh, higher education, there are still some inequities. So the, uh, I don't like to suggest that the access era is over. 
I like to use the word mature. So the access era has matured, and we're now in the beginning of a different era that has been called, it's not my term, uh, the success era. Now, the success era is not, does not mean let's pat ourselves on the back for the great job we've done. It really means that all those folks who now are attending uh, college and university um, have not been succeeding um, at the same rate as, let's say, folks with a history of college and um, I think many of us are aware of these inequities and the differences in the six-year graduation rate between uh, African-American students and white students, for instance. Um, and um, the, the topic here, first-generation students, also uh, belongs in this context, uh, that part of the access movement allowed uh, students with, or folks without a history, a family history of college attendance, to um, attend university and college for the first time. Um, and it's very nice that they're here, and we're all happy that they're here, and yes, I think we should be proud of the fact that they are here, but maybe we shouldn't be so proud of the rate that they are succeeding, because in many cases, they are not succeeding at an acceptable rate. Um, there is work to be done. So that term, success era, means we're now in an era where we really have to start paying attention to these students and really support them and really support their success. Uh, this, of course, also dovetails with uh, the, the more recent uh, national attention on um, the efficiency and success of our post-secondary education system. And many people looking at the national six-year graduation rate nationally for the United States is 56%, um, which is close to half, which a lot of folks, a lot of politicians and parents and policymakers are saying, does that mean that the post-secondary education is only operating at 50% efficiency? Um, it doesn't really mean that. We know that. But many people are saying, whatever it means, that's too Oh, and so um, the, in this era of shrinking budgets and everybody's extremely worried as we should be about uh, the California budget situation and we're all experiencing uh, budget cuts, um, the pressure's on, the focus is on. How are institutions going to increase the six year graduation rate so that the people who drum up money and go before Congress and other uh, policy uh, makers can say, we need more money to do this work um, and, and prevent those people from saying, well, we're not giving you money because you're not doing a very good job. Um, hence the pressure to increase uh, retention rates and the six-year graduation rate. And so that's the other context that I like to talk about these issues in, and that is, um, increasing, how, how, do, how do we, and let's get specific about it, how do we as a Nova State increase our retention rates and increase our graduation rate, six-year graduation rate, which is 51%. How do we do this? And I think many of you know the, the Chancellor's Office of the CSU system has caught on to all this, and, and they have <laughs> initiated what's called the Graduation Initiative which is a charge to all the institutions in the CSU system, all 23, to increase their graduation rate. And I believe um, Sonoma State has been charged to increase its graduation rate by six or seven percent by, I think it's 2015, 2016. So we've been charged to raise our graduation rate from 51% to 57%, uh, 58%. How are we going to do this? And so, um, we're going to do this. One way to do this is to is to is to really be, and this is my own personal state, is to really be a leader in the success era. To really um, understand that the way to um, become more efficient and the way to raise our graduation rate is to pay attention to 
the traditional groups that the statistics show are not um, achieving at the same rate as other groups. And first generation students are one of those groups. Um, I th let me stop right there and see if anybody has any questions or comments about that introduction and then we'll get into the, into the, into the slideshow. Okay, again, at any time, please uh, get my attention, raise your hand if you have a question or anything to interject and um, that would be great. Okay, so let's say that, that Sonoma State decided that um, we, the way we want to raise our graduation rate is to, is to direct some resources toward our first generation student population. Um, why would we do that? How would we do that? That's the subject of my book. And so we'll <coughs> try to answer some of those questions. Uh, one of the things I argue in my book is that part of the problem of the lack of success of first generation students has to do with things like definitions. Um, in fact, if you look at the student affairs and educational research on the performance of first generation students, you will find multiple definitions. Uh, you will find the two most common common are first generation students um, are those students who come from a family where neither parent have a bachelor's degree. That's the definition that I subscribe to. By the way, that's the trio definition. Um, that, that's, that is how one determines who a first generation student is. I am a first generation student. Now raise your hand if you were a first generation student when you went to university. And it's about half. So, and, and that's, and, and that is um, a very interesting percentage that you see um, represented all over the place. I, um, I, I usually, when I speak to people, I suggest that uh, the percentage at Sonoma State is between 35 and 40 percent. 35 and 40 percent of our students are first generation students, but that could be low. And one of the reasons it's low is we don't count them. We don't really know. Um, we, uh, how do I come to 35, 40%? Well, basically it is a result of the National SERP survey that, that um, I think all accredited institutions in the, in the United States, that's probably not all, most of them participate in. We participate in that. It's part of our first day, first day program. Um, and um, other, other sorts of sources of information not the least of which being the learning center and the students who come in and, and um, keeping track of them. Um, but there are, uh, yes? Um, about that degree from a four-year institution, what about it being from out of the United States? That comes up. Um, and it comes up in the context of the TRIO programs because we do sometimes have students come into the, to the learning center who would like to be learning center uh, uh, or learning school services participants, but they they check that one of their parents do in fact have a bachelor's degree, and we find out that it's from a foreign country. It's often a tough call, but now I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question, Dean Stoffer, because it points to the reality here. Yes, we can talk, talk about definitions, and that's all fine and good, but what first generation student status is all about is what, what was the household like? And, um, and what was it like being in, uh, and we can call it an, Amer an American minority group, namely uh, being, 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 being belonging to that group of families that don't have a tradition of college education. And so, uh, and, and the TRIO regulations allow a little bit of latitude here but how I usually determine that is I talk to the student and I try to find out some sense of, of, of how privileged these, these, these people were in their country. Um, what does it actually mean to have a degree in India, for instance? 
um, and try to make a, dis a determination that way. But um, it's a hard it's a hard call because education systems are, are not necessarily uh, you know compatible that way. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other real common way to define it is to, is to be more restrictive than that and say that um, neither one of the parents uh, can ever have set foot on a college campus. In other words, not even have a single unit of credit. And, and it can get more complicated than that. People, people want to include or, or separate out uh, two year degrees, AA degrees, and this is the problem, right? Um, and I didn't know this was the case until I started working into the research literature. Even the research community uses different definitions, which is a big problem, right? Because then you can't compare one, one group of results with another. Um, and so part of uh, the advocacy in this group is to suggest to the research community, we need, a, we need a, a specific definition. This is the one that I recommend. Um, now, uh, you know, why is it important to have a definition or a universal definition people might ask. Um, and it, you know, it, as, as uh, Dean Stockton's question points out, it's not important when you're sitting across the, the table from a student and working with that student. But, as we all know, um, if, if you can't represent to the people who um, you know, hold, hold the money how many students, how many do you have, um, they're not as likely to extend resources and um, support for those students. So you can't go to a funding body and, and say, well, we'd like um, some money to support our first generation students. Well, what is that? What's the proportion? Well, we don't really know. You know, we have some. <laughs> not going to happen, right? That's why, I, that's one of the reasons I suggest a universal the definition is important. And uh, connected with that is we really need to them, and we really need to know for a fact how many of our students are first generation students. The other reason is institutional acceptance. Um, again, even if you walk around Sonoma State and talk about first generation students, I've been doing it for a long time, um, if, if there isn't a specific definition and the whole thing is kind of muddled, you know, and now we're getting into what are the characteristics. Uh, people don't remember. You know, maybe it's not that important. If we don't know exactly who these students are and what their characteristics are, maybe it's just not important. And that has been, I must say, um, a problem. Um, I think, uh, you know, and, and I'm not going to suggest Sonoma State has been a problem because but some, Sonoma State is reflective of most institutions across the country in that. Um, we have we have some folks, some faculty, some student affairs uh, prof professionals, and other uh, people who less and less. But when I first began in ten years ago, started talking about this, who kind of had the opinion, yeah, we're just doing the parents. Uh, it's not that big a deal, you know. So your parents didn't go to college. Uh, you come here, you're just like everybody else. Uh, we can uh, show you. Um, um, where the cashier's office is and um, how to add a class. And then you're just going to be like everybody else. Um, that turns out not to be the case. Uh, first generation students um, succeed at a far lower rate than non first generation mm -hmm. students. So it must be a bigger deal than that. That's probably the biggest theme of, of my book is that, and I can say it in a phrase or sentence, being a first generation student is a very big deal. Yeah, the barriers, although, and this is another problem, they tend to be um, not readily identifiable. Uh, they tend to be, um, and say, psychological. Um, and uh, it's, it's easy for a lot of first generation students to appear to know what's going on. Um, but all that stuff wrapped up together turns out to be a very big deal. 
There's another reason why we should uh, have a universal definition and count our first generation students. It's an old state too. I think we should we should really make an effort here to to count and identify our first generation student population. I think if we did that, just the act of doing that and having it be a recognized category and having students know that 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 they belong in, 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 there's a group that they belong in, and that there are some characteristic uh, uh, barriers, I think that alone would increase retention and graduation rates among that group. Um, without any other kinds of support. Um, so, you know, I, I, in my own limited way, have been advocating that we do that for a while, but. I don't want to single Sonoma State out because not one single CSU campus counts as first-generation student population and knows how many of uh, those students attend. Some institutions are catching on. Um, one that I know for sure is Stanford University. They have been counting the first-generation student population for not very long, three years. They've been doing it for three years, might be their fourth. Um, and so they, they can tell you we have this many first generation student, students <coughs> in our freshman class this year. Um, and one of the reasons they're doing that, because I know this because I've seen the reports and I've seen the public statements of Stanford administration, they're doing it because they're making the argument that first generation students add to the diversity of their institution. They're doing it because they're, they are realizing that first generation students come to the campus with uh, a, a different view of the United States, of a different view of college going. Um, they um, have a, 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 a different imagination of what college going is like. Um, and accessing that um, can be beneficial to everybody in an institution. It can be, uh, for your faculty members, it can be benefit to your, to your classes. Um, as we'll get into a little, a little more about their characteristics, you might imagine first generation students are more reluctant to speak up in class, they're more reluctant to um, uh, describe their experience in our classrooms. Um, and they, uh, if you can get them to do that, they definitely add to the, to the fabric of the, cla of the classroom and the, um, and the institution. That's another really good reason Let's not just let Stanford get on credit. You know, we should be doing that too. Um, and as I've said before, you know, it's not about um, the definition. It's about the presence in that household of, of a privileging of college growth. Um, it's about demonstrating a certain that's could say a certain kind of critical thinking that we like to think at Sonoma State and other post-secondary institutions. One of the things that we are uh, teaching our students is this process of critical thinking. It's about seeing, um, it's seeing mom and dad and other family members demonstrating this. Um, it's about um, having parents talk about Professor X uh, was really nice, and Professor Y was a real hard ass, and really, you know, gave everybody bad grades. Um, it's about all that 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 uh, non-first generation students are exposed to in their households. Again, hard hard to measure. Um, and if you look at the research literature on first generation students, you're yeah, it, it's it's. It tends to be things like um, standardized tests, um, performance on math placements, tests, and that sort of quantifiable hard data, which is important. But and I think what happens is because that's the easy stuff to test for, and it's the quantifiable stuff. Uh, education educators start thinking that that's what's really important, but my argument is, yes, that's important, but, but growing up in a, uh, uh, in a, in a first-generation student household 
is more important. Um, the, the, the lack of what I call the, uh, the intuitive orientation toward college. Uh, that's the phrase that I use to describe what non-first generation students have. They get this from, from growing up in a uh, non-first generation student household. Um, and as this slide suggests, it's not this, this stuff that for a long time, I think a lot of people associated with first generation student status which is, you know, these kind of real service level navigational kinds of information. And if you think about it, um, even a student with, uh, you know, five generations before him or her um, in college, and they arrive here at Sonoma State in the first year, they don't know what a cashier is. Um, they don't really know the, the, the process for adding a class. Uh, so that stuff isn't, isn't what we're talking about here. That's not what I'm um, talking about when I, when I use this phrase, the intuitive orientation uh, toward college. Um, and one of the things that, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to um, stop for a second and, and talk a little bit about method here in the book. Because these, these uh, opinions and, and findings that I'm describing here are, are, are the result of basically two gathering data in two different ways. One is um, a survey of the research literature, the student affairs and education research letter, literature on the performance of first generation students. But it's also um, based on my experience, years and years of experience in working with first generation students. So those, those two sources of information. Um, and uh, when I saw the, the last uh, um, element on this slide, having a vision of the future that includes yourself as a college graduate, uh, that's the kind of stuff that I realized when, I, when I'm working with first generation students that is not present. Um, another way of thinking about this, this, this uh, intuitive orientation toward college is to think about non-first generation students and how college going is represented in those kinds of families. Um, it's often represented as, uh, generally speaking here, right? It's often represented as almost a stage in the natural development of a person, right? Um, you, uh, uh, when you become 17, 18, you've been prepared by your parents that the first stage here, well, uh, it begins even earlier, but you're starting to prepare yourself for college. Um, and now, as everybody works with all kinds of Sonoma State students knows, um, it is about um, um, preparing yourself and then uh, having expectations put upon you that you will be a college student. And in non-first generation student families, I believe, this is represented as almost a natural progression, and maybe even, and this sounds more harsh than I should mean it, but you're, you're, you're really a fully vested member of our family when you are going to college. That's, that's, that's part of how we do things in our family, right? And also, and, and, and if, if this kind of uh, imaginative structure is communicated, then also uh, after college, as well. Uh, the, 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 the future as a college graduate is just part of the whole thing, right? It's not something tacked on, you know, um, that maybe you can do, maybe you can't do. It is part of this whole identity development process. And this is the thing that, become, that can become interrupted or can become fragmented, I think, in, um, in uh, first generation student families. Well, yes. I was sort of how you wondered how you felt about students um, in families where they, the parents have had this great success, they're making tons of money, but there are their attitudes, I never went to college and look at me, how great I'm doing, Bob with this whole college thing. And I'm not sure where that fits in that. Right. Um, exactly. It, um, what I think a family like, a family like that is not 
this intuitive orientation toward college, um, they are communicating a different kind of framework, perhaps, uh, of radical individualism, perhaps, that, um, like you said, college, we do things ourselves here. You know, we, we, we um, um, have been um, craftsmen forever, and look at all the, 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 the good work we do. Um, I definitely want to get back to that as well. Um, we're almost at one o'clock, are we? Uh, I want to go through, I have a metaphor for describing this that I think I'm going to run through uh, to get to some other things. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that in, in further response to Dean Stocker's question, um, that the family mythology of non-first generation students can have this, quote, nat that sense of natural development to becoming a college educated person. And the research shows that first generation families can have their own kind of mythology. And sometimes it's benign to college going, but sometimes it is um, adverse to college going. And I think that's, that is, that what, what Dean Stock describes is a kind of uh, negative family mythology. Um, there, there are others as well that, and, 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 and they, this can even have an effect on the student if he or she does arrive at, at Sonoma State, say, with, with major selection and the purpose of, of college because the research literature shows that first generation students are much more likely, for instance, to choose the business major. And that perhaps is a um, is evidence of a different kind of family mythology about college going, which is it's all about getting a high paying job. Um, I see some people nodding, and we see this a lot as a home state, no doubt, right? Um, I, and, and so, although that's not a, as negative as the, the family mythology that um, um, college going is unnecessary, um, it still can be damaging to the student once, or he, she, or once, once he or she arrives at the institution. The next thing I would like to do is something that I also think has been important to the, the lack of crystallization of this category, let's say. This term first generation student has been around for some 20, 30 years, but I argue in my book, it's, it, it never really crystallized. And, there, and I think we're just now uh, really starting to have it crystallized. I know I have a difficulty because I'm immersed in this, but I see the term much more often now. Those of you who've been in education for 10, 15 years, um, I don't know whether you would agree with this or not, but 15 years ago, oh, maybe you know, maybe you've heard of it, but um, not as often as we're seeing it now. Um, this crystallization process is happening. One of the things I think that has um, uh, prevented this full crystallization is the association with low income status. Um, when I first started talking about first generation students at Sonoma State, um, many people had a one-to-one -one association with first generation status, that it meant the person was low income. And, and the person really didn't make much of a distinction between first generation student status and low income status. Um, uh, and again, so that, that led to this lack of crystallization of this, of this category, I think, to, um, to uh, the disadvantage of first generation students. Now, um, another thing that I'm saying when I make that distinction is, I'm not suggesting that first generation student does not to some degree map with low income status. We know that in the United States that college attainment is strongly correlated with income money. Uh, we know this to be a fact. Uh, but what I am suggesting is that when we have students who are both first generation students and low income students, they are hit in a sense with double whammy. They have the barriers of being a first generation student and do they have the barriers of being a low-income student. But as uh, Dean Stauffer's question suggests, 
not all of our first generation students are low income students. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, not even close. Um, the, the chart uh, here shows, and this is from 2000 census data, the, the census actually does, I, and I must say, I need to look into this, I don't know exactly what their criteria is for establishing first generation students. I should know that. But they do gather data um, using this term first generation student families and non first generation student families. And this is, this is the result. Uh, I like to kind of look at the bottom um, row first. And, uh, you know, uh, nobody should be surprised that, um, you know, uh, folks from a uh, family of college attendants. Um, don't uh, end up in the, in the fourth quartile of, uh, of American family income very often, 2.2%. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised that a significant number of first generation students uh, uh, do end up in, uh, uh, from families with uh, family income in the lowest quartile. But if you go up from the bottom in the first generation student family, Category, you see that it's much more evenly distributed. And in fact, um, more than a quarter of first generation student families uh, report income in the highest quartile. Um, and, I mean, although it's pretty, it's pretty evenly distributed, quarter, 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 the, 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 the quartile that they are less reported in is um, um, the bottom quartile. So uh, it is a myth that first generation student status simply means low income status. Uh, one of the handouts I gave you is, a, is my further effort to distinguish uh, uh, first generation student status from uh, low income status. Um, and again, this is not meant to be a description of low income status. Uh, this is meant to make the argument that uh, low income students uh, face additional barriers to being first generation students if they are both low income students and first generation students. And again, this chart is produced by uh, my survey of the research literature and um, my own experience working with um, students for a long time. Um, so, in this effort to kind of distinguish the characteristics of these different groups of students, um, I begin thinking about this, what I call the existent existential question about college attendance, which is, as you might imagine, you know, why do you want to go to college? Why are you a college student? Um, and, um, the sociologists Richard Kochberg and William Komu, in their uh, theory of really important and big life decision making, I mean, decisions like you know becoming married, um, leaving your hometown, um, uh, job selection. Um, I've done research that shows if you ask um, low income folks this question. Um, you are likely to get what they call a sociological, a sociological answer. Um, we've already made hints at this. Um, answers like, um, I need to make more money for my family so my family can have a better life. Um, I, and, and they'll be specific about, I need to be a college student so I can get a good job after, but we know Plenty of non-low income students think that these days too, right? Um, it's not exclusive just to low income students. But it'll be questions about improving um, status in you know, the American uh, social system. Um, if you ask this question of um, non-first generation students, students with a family history of attending college, you get a completely different kind of answer an answer that the sociologists call a personal answer. Uh, it will be uh, answers like, well, I, I, my brother is going. Um, 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 I go, I'm going to college because that's what I do. That's what um, people like me do. You know, um, 
I go to college because my family's always gone to college. Um, and their research suggests that first generation students are kind of in the middle of there somewhere. They call it a hybrid answer. You know, they, they do both. They kind of go back and forth between those two. Um, in this category, uh, temporal or orientation to college attendance, um, the, the notion is that um, uh, low income students um, are, are more focused on the future with regard to their college attendance. Not to say that they're not engaged when they're here, but they really are focused on the deliverables, right, at the end of the process. Um, and I suggest that non-first generation students, students with a family history of college attendance, are more past-oriented. And again, it doesn't mean that they're not focused, but when they think about college going, they, they, they have this background that they can, they, can, they can fall on. They can think in terms of their parents who attended college. They can um, um, think about friends and family members who attended college. Uh, now, again, I argue that first generation students are, again, more in the middle, and I want to suggest that they're present oriented. Uh, they are, first generation students are, are more likely, and so this is where we're getting into uh, the behavior and characteristics of first generation students that really can be a benefit to everybody. They are more present in the sense that perhaps they are more curious about what's going on. Um, they're not so focused on the future that they're, they're, they're locked into a certain kind of product. They're not so comfortable that they, they look backward to this long this history of college attendance. They are uh, um, focused on what's going on here. And that's why I argue they can be some of the best students in your classes in the sense that they can ask challenging questions, they can ask uh, questions that other kinds of students aren't asking uh, because either they're too forward uh, oriented or too past oriented. Another area um, is one that happens to be on, um, you know, is sometimes on a lot of people's minds because we all deal with the, uh, with the, the student who feels he or she is, is entitled to all kinds of stuff here at Sonoma State. And we love these students but sometimes they can get dry. Um, and so this question of level of entitlement, um, uh, I, I want to argue that low-income students, and by the way, when I say level, level of entitlement, I mean this. I mean, uh, and we can think of it this way, um, the, the, the degree to which they buy into the, uh, the American discourse that suggests that all Americans are entitled to a post-second, or entitled to uh, pursue a post-secondary education. That's what we believe, that all Americans, all citizens, are entitled to pursuing an education and a higher education. Um, Low-income students uh, are less likely to buy into that, right? They perhaps have had a very difficult time overcoming those kinds of barriers that remind them that they might not be entitled to a, a higher education. Um, on the other hand, students with a, uh, uh, a long history of family uh, uh, college, college going may feel fully entitled, which goes back to that sense of a developmental process. First generation students, again, uh, not really sure. You know, am I really entitled to this? Um, am I not? Um, they are uh, more likely to be pondering these questions, which sometimes I think can be identified as confusion um, when we um, advise them or if they are in our classrooms. We might misidentify that as, um, as lack of motivation or confusion, but it's not really that. It's trying to figure it out um, and being uh, not very sophisticated about post-secondary education and hence not really having the language to fully describe it. So um, 
that's one of the things that, that and you know, and our our advising department well knows this, um, and they are able to recognize these signs. But when a when a first generation student doesn't give an immediate answer to even the existential question about college attendance, it might not be because they haven't thought about it. It might not be because it might be because they're pondering it and they're grasping for the language to uh, to communicate it to you. And the last area, and we've already kind of, you know, well, I want to make one point about this notion of developing a college student identity, and that is um, that um, a that there is a college uh, student identity, and that. In, in non-first generation student families, it is um, built in that when you get your college degree, you, in a sense, will be a different person. You will be an educated person. And in some families, that's sort of the last step before you become an adult, right? Um, now you're an educated person. Um, and many non-first generation fam uh, students, uh, I argue, will assume that that's going to be the case. That when they um, have earned their bachelor's degree, they, they understand that in a sense they will be a different person. They are now an educated person. Um, uh, my experience with working with low income students is they are more uh, survivalist about this in a sense they don't think they're necessarily going to be a different person. They think they uh, they uh, they think I'm going to be I'm the same person. I was raised in this in this uh, this low income area and it was tough living there. And I had to work hard to to um, um, that is uh, I think of it in terms uh, almost in terms of language acquisition. That uh, as we know, you know all human beings are born with the capacity to to speak a human language. They're they're born with an innate grammar, so so to speak. Um, and uh, that's sort of the way I think about non-first generation students. They arrive with this intuitive orientation, almost like a hardwired sort of orientation toward the world. Um, first generation students are. More, it's more uh, uh, gaining this orientation toward college is more like acquiring a second language, and, uh, and 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 many of you undoubtedly are bilingual, and you know that process. You know when you finally achieve that second language, many people describe it as you know I had my first dream in Spanish or whatever the language is. Now it's it. You know now I'm fluid and now I'm bilingual. Um, I think. First generation students, but but the last point is, they will, many of them will also say, ah, it's not quite the same as my primary language. Now I'm completely fluid, it's not quite the same as my primary language. Uh, the way I like to think, uh, using this metaphor, is first generation students are, are kind of like that second language acquisition. I think they can get all this stuff, they can approximate this intuitive orientation. College. And it's up to us as post secondary educators <coughs> to help them get there. They can approximate it, but it's not really ever going to be the same as growing up in a family uh, of college attendance, uh, with a long history of college attendance. Okay, and um, you know, I, I want to, I, I, I talk about this intuitive orientation toward college, I want to give at least one hard example of what I'm talking about here. And uh, one of my favorites, I know I have many of them talking to students over the years, many, many students describe this uh, very eloquently in, in the 14 narratives, um, is uh, uh, a story told to me by a, uh, a first generation student who was a uh, first time freshman here at Sonoma State. And she was describing the year before when she was a high school student, and she went to the, the, a friend's house when she was a senior in high school, um, uh, who, who was a non-first generation student, uh, who, uh, right, uh, growing up in a household of, uh, of college, uh, privileging college education. And they happened to be in the living room wherever they are, were, and they were looking at the bookshelf, and 
uh, the first generation student pulled the book off the shelf and thumbed through it, and there was writing in it. There was all kinds of writing in it. And her friend said, oh yeah, that was my mother or father's book from college, right? And the first generation student um, described for me, you know, the surprise that she felt when she saw this book with all the writing in it. Because in her family, uh, they had books in the house, but they were treated like precious artifacts. You know, you don't, you would never write in them. Now, you know, uh, there's another part to the story because that that alone is not what I'm what I'm suggesting uh, represents the uh, intuitive orientation toward college. Um, it's it's a one step further because what that writing represents um, is not some. Uh, you know, intransigence against, you know, writing books. It is um, evidence of an understanding of one's relationship to the text. It is, you know, uh, an understanding that you interact with the text, right? And people who write in their books, you know, they're writing for a variety of reasons. They write to remind themselves of things that they thought. They, they, they write questions maybe even for the imagined author. Um, there is this back and forth and, and lively interaction with the, the reader, which would, uh, uh, and someone who, with the intuitive orientation toward college, and who progressed in this way when at college, achieves. And that's the thing that first generation students lack. That kind of understanding of uh, the gaining of knowledge and the and the in, and and how knowledge creation is done, and so one of my recommendations is for all of us to uh, in our classrooms to make this kind of thing that we that we sometimes take for granted very transparent to our students uh, and and very and and, and first generation students benefit this from this uh, uh, more than most students because it, they haven't arrived with this sense. That, that student, I don't know this for sure, this non-first generation student may, may have had a dialogue with his or, his or her parent who wrote his book, and that parent may have described this whole thing, you know, and maybe that, that, that child saw the, the parent, and, and, and you can't really see it, but saw the person interacting with the text that way. So uh, that's, that's what I mean by this intuitive orientation toward college, and, that's, and that is, an example of what I think is a significant barrier for, for performance, as you might imagine, once our first generation students actually um, get here. Um, in my book, um, I, I come to the conclusion that there are, uh, there's a core to this experience, and, and, and it really, more than anything else, was produced by multiple readings of those 14 narratives. I do have a chapter in the book where I describe that process of reading the 14 narratives and um, suggesting that there is core, this core experience and sort of uh, identifying it in the narratives themselves. And um, as a result of that, um, have come up with what I call these, these five core elements of the first generation student experience. And, that, and they're written on one of the handouts. Um, and the first one is, um, uh, a lack of sophistication about education, um, but not only the post-secondary education, the K-12 K system as well. And that lack of sophistication about the K-12 uh, K system carries over into their performance at, at, at our institution and any other board of institution. One very good example of this, and many of you have many other examples, is um, I'm sure a lot of, uh, many people know that uh, and it's happened, I think, in the last 10 years or so, where Matt Hunt Pedagogy um, has suggested that um, um, students should take and pass Algebra 1 in the 8th grade. Uh, and it's also a method of tracking students. Uh, I know my, my son, who's not a first-generation student, of course, um, is a senior in high school now, but when he was in the 8th grade, I knew this, so I made damn sure he was in Algebra 1 when he was in 8th grade. Um, that kind of knowledge 
um, is not uh, that kind of sophistication about the education system is is likely not present in um, the the parents of first generation students, and so they are less likely. They're more likely to contract, of course, into lower levels, um, but they are also uh, less likely to benefit from that kind of advocacy and a lot of other um, sorts of ad 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 advocacy. Now, connected to this, this is, this is one of my, um, I, I really, maybe this is the next thing I, I'll turn to in, in my career, and, I, and I'm intensely interested in this, and that is the epidemic of, of uh, math phobia in our country. Um, you know, you have students who say, um, I can't do math. Um, I don't like it. I can't do it. Um, and really, uh, oftentimes what they're suggesting is um, I'm, I'm biologically um, adverse to understanding math. Some of them will even say, oh, I, I must have some kind of learning disability. Um, by the way, the, the learning disability says with that, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the term for it, very rare. Extremely rare, and 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 students who are are behaving like this, it's not because their brains are different from students who do math. Um, my my, uh, what I'd really like to find out is um, how connected that sort of uh, uh, demonstration of a perceived lack of math comp competency is um, as developed in. Um, in a uh, first generation household. And it's, it's not because first generation uh, uh, parents don't know the value of math. It is because I think non-first generation families are, are, and parents are aware of this. So the first, uh, this is just one uh, you know, assumption, the first sign they see of their children going, oh, I don't like math, they're on it, you know? Um, well, why do you think that? Here's how, here's how you can perform this. Here, and, and they're much quicker to get tutoring, and that sort of thing. Um, so, really interesting. One of the reasons I'm really interested in that is, I'm sure many of you are aware that a lot of, um, uh, uh, well, uh, education research shows that um, a lot of math competency and uh, testing into remediation, I mean, here it's no state, um, is uh, strongly with related to success at the post-secondary <coughs> level, which, which means that having a good background in math and thinking of yourself as competent in math is connected with a whole bunch of other stuff, uh, performing in your anthropology class, in your English class, and in all disciplines. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm very interested in that business of I'm not good at math. Um, the second element in this core experience um, is, um, and, I've, and I have described this you know, as we've gone on, is this notion of being an outsider um, to the whole process of education. Uh, first generation students think of themselves as being outside the norm um, for college going. Um, and on the one hand, I don't think that's necessarily horrible because when you don't feel like you're a member of an in-group, but you're interested in becoming a member of that in-group, it's not a bad idea to maybe stand on the sidelines a little bit and check it out, you know, and, and see how see how the people in the in-group behave. Um, and uh, one way of thinking about uh, the, the lack of retention in the first generation student population is um, they have, you know, they have to make that jump into the in group, which is the the, the college going identity, right? And those that stay out are the ones that drop out and don't graduate. Um, but I think uh, the, the the literature also shows that you can have uh, the other side of that. Being an outsider is you can kind of develop this cowboy attitude about it, you know, like uh, I don't need help from anybody. You know, I'm an outsider and I'm just going to do it my way, and um, uh, that's how I'm going to do it. Well, you know, maybe not. Um, 
you do need support. And uh, this is another bit of research I'd like to do. I have not seen it uh, associated with first generation students, but many of you probably know of this effect, this, this behavior surrounding tutoring, that most of the, um, the research on who gets tutoring at the post-secondary level, good students do. Better performing students are the ones in our tutoring center, um, um, which you know, blows people's minds. And, well, you know, when you think about being an outsider, perhaps being a first-generation student, it makes a little more sense because it's kind of like, well, extra help? That's for students who don't know what they're doing, you know? I'm going to figure it out on my own. So this, this, this outsider persona, on the one hand, can be necessary, maybe even a little positive, on the other hand, can be dangerous. Um, and always when we're, we're considering um, first generation students, uh, we have to remember that, you know, and, and you see this phrase a lot in the, in the research literature on first generation students, straddling two cultures, you know. They're, they're, they have one foot back in the, in the quote, home culture, and one foot in the college going culture. And in certain ways, they have to go back and forth. Um, and, you know, um, the postmodern theories, I, I've often thought this, uh, uh, more in the era of postmodernism and thinking about postmodernism, doesn't, doesn't help first generation students very much in this area, I don't think, because, um, you know, we're all, we're all very interested in the notion of fragmented identities and, and one identity isn't um, uh, suggested to be better or higher than the other. Um, and it's all flat, right? Um, but there is something called college going culture. And if you're going to be um, adverse to that um, 100%, it is really hard to succeed in college. Um, and you, you, along with that, you have other sorts of pressures. Another thing that we always have to consider when we're considering first generation students is the is the as the is the family dynamic, right? Um, and first generation parents um, are rarely openly adverse to college going. Some can be, um, but they often um, will communicate uh, uh, things to students that. They don't, the parents don't realize it, but it makes it harder for their sons and daughters here at the institution. Um, even, even very, um, you know, uh, even sweet kind of um, poignant comments like, I really miss you, you know, I really uh, would like to have you here with me, um, can put pressure on a first generation student to return, return to the home culture. Studies to, there is there is research on uh, first generation students that suggests they go they go home much more often they go back and forth between campuses it's not just a function of um, being more likely to go to quote commuter schools because uh, you can compare students from non first generation households and first generation students um, and maybe they're both living off campus but but first generation students tend to go back home more often. Um, that's an important thing to consider. Uh, and the, fi the final um, um, element of this, of this uh, core experience, I'd like to think, is I think, I think first generation students do have kind of a special um, um, dimension and, and uh, ability to overcome obstacles. And um, I can't, you know, this is part of my whole theory, but it's the, the because the first generation student, student experience is so um, important and, and, and such a big deal, the ones who do overcome it really, you know, have done quite a bit. Um, and so uh, I, I believe that also would be the case. There's a special kind of determination. Now, um, again, you know, 
people might suggest, yes, I kind of understand this now, you know, yes, I think there's different psychology and all that, but still, what's the big deal? Well, the, uh, the, the, um, the National Percent Center for Education Statistics um, um, report that is still, you know, it's still, it's 10 years old now. Uh, and it's still, uh, but it's still referenced all the time. It's a very in-depth longitudinal study of performance, the academic performance of first-generation students. And they measured the uh, 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 graduation in an eight-year period, not a six-year period. Um, their results showed that non-first-generation students, this is nationally, this is all students, and this is even, um, this is even students who began in a community college. Um, um, nationally, non-first generation students graduate at 68%, and first generation students, half of that, half of that rate, 34%. So that's, that's the study and the statistic I like to quote to people who are still maybe a little skeptical about whether or not the first generation student is a, is a big deal. That's, that's pretty good proof that it is a very and why I, I really uh, would, uh, and you know, um, I happen to be on the, um, the committee at Sonoma State that is charged with uh, organizing the system-wide graduation initiative. And I, I, you know, I sometimes sound like a one-trick pony because uh, I really would like Sonoma State to, A, count and track our first-generation students and find out. How are our first generation students performing? Are they graduating at half the rate of our non first generation students? Remember, uh, it's probably probably 40% of our students are not our first generation students, and maybe even more. Um, if they are graduating at half the rate of the non first generation students, if we can supply some support so that they graduate at 75% of the rate of non-first generation students. We're gonna bump our graduation rate up by you know, four, five, four or five percent right there. Um, and so I, 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 you know, I, I try to advocate for that being part of the way that Sonoma State is, is going to uh, perform the uh, the, uh, the graduation initiative. Okay. Yes. I, I happened to go to the there was a CSU meeting on closing the gap related to the graduation initiative, and I think there were seven of, seven of us that were there. Yeah. yeah. You'll be sad to hear that um, it only came up one time yeah. in that six hours Ooh. as far as uh, first generation students, and zero mention of students with disabilities, which was another area that could receive more attention. Another area. You know, and, and I mentioned that I, I uh, was in Madison on Tuesday doing this uh, webinar, and during the, and there, and there were some 75 post-secondary institutions subscribed to this, and so they were the live um, viewers, and there were some poll questions, and uh, one of the poll questions was, does your institution count your first-generation student population? But, and many of those institutions Midwest institution, and a, a pretty high number said yes. And I have been, I, there, I, I want to say there are other areas of the country that know, that are ahead of us with regard to this. And I want to suggest the Midwest area for some reason is, but that's, I'm not surprised to hear that, that it seems to me the West Coast and maybe the CSU system were behind the curve on this, and, and maybe that is, um, um, are we almost we're at? Uh, um, you know, you know what I think. Before um, I just open it up to any other kinds of questions, if you flip to the back of this, um, is the rest of this um, presentation are recommendations. You know, I think I want to make. I want to move to one here. Let's do this and then this. Question of study skills. Am I? My thinking on this is, is changing, and I want to relate that. But, well, no, I'll do that first. Um, 
the one that wrote the book, and um, you know, we have this concept of study skills. And you know, uh, if you talk to people, it's kind of there's not a lot of consensus about what it is, um, and, and uh, how you teach it, and can you teach it, and um, and maybe I, I came to this conclusion dealing with my recalcitrant son one day, you know, who. Um, he got a bad grade on a test, and his response to me was, I don't know how to study for tests. And um, I know his behavior, and I was aware of what he was doing, and he hardly cracked the freaking book at all. Um, and so his response was he didn't know how to study for tests. But the, but the real thing was he wasn't studying at all. Um, and and uh, he, he, he perfectly knows how to study for a test. Um, and and you know, this, this question of study skills, I'm now, you know, and I, you can see here, I, 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 I'd like to remove that, you know, first generation students need a class in study skills. I don't, I don't really think that, and I'd like to collapse that recommendation really into this one. And that is um, um, first generation students um, need to more than other kinds. I think all students need need uh, um, to learn with others. Um, they need more collaborative education. Um, and I'm now I'm I'm starting to really believe that that is how that's the best way to improve study skills is to have our students um, study in groups. And you know we're moving toward this obviously. You know, uh, there's their uh, Sonoma State students now learn in groups much more than they did 15 years ago. And so, I mean, this isn't rocket science or anything. We, we know this is the case. I happen to think the reason for that has a lot to do with um, uh, high-tech communication devices <coughs> and high-tech and high, and high communication technology that um, more and more, I think, you know, we're going to have to move toward more collaborative education whether we want to or not. Because I think we're going to be getting fewer students who can learn by themselves. Um, they are so used to, and a lot of people think, what are you talking about, high-tech communication technology? Because I see my son, he's at his laptop, and it's just him with the laptop and the internet. But what people don't understand is um, that laptop is not monovocal. You know, it's not just this one thing. He's, he's, he's um, uh, communicating by email with his friends. He is um, getting information from a website. He's getting information from something else. So my, my argument is contemporary students, even though they look like they may be studying in a solitary way, um, it doesn't seem solitary to them. Um, they feel like they are in a group. And so um, this movement toward collaborative education, I think, is, is absolutely necessary. But, but finally, on the back of the, uh, the five core elements, um, what I've done here is, is um, reduce and summarize the 14 recommendations um, in the book um, down to three. And, um, and these, these are, I think these are all things that our graduation and initiative committee are thinking about. And I would really like to see us, Sonoma State, pursue these. Um, and, and again, the recommendations and, um, and this synthesis down to three is generated from uh, my survey of the research literature and my own experience with um, Sonoma State students. I think the first recommendation I would make to improve the retention for, for, for first generation students but for all, maybe all our students, is a quicker immersion in um, an academic discipline major. I, you're, you're, you're seeing this in the student affairs literature. You're seeing that more institutions are moving toward having their students declare a uh, major earlier in their matriculation. You know, it's no mistake. We, we uh, put a hold on students uh, if they don't uh, declare by the beginning of their junior year, I personally would like to see us move that one year forward. Um, now, uh, in terms of first generation students, why is that 
a good thing. They need structure. Um, they are not sophisticated about the education system. If we allow them to float around and not be attached in a very significant way to the institution, they are more likely to drop out. So quick, and a, a quicker immersion in an academic discipline mean, and another, and another thing it means, which all the research literature shows is that connection with faculty is maybe even the most important thing with regard to retention. Um, and a whole host of things happen when, when, when students have, con have contact, and you know, there's a whole spectrum of contact. Uh, the more contact, the better. The more significant contact, the better. Um, they, they feel attached to the institution. They, 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 not, they not only, and, and that attachment occurs by being immersed, per, can occur, one of the ways it can occur, is by being fully immersed in an academic discipline. And a result of that is, it is connection with faculty. It becomes, they're attached to a body of knowledge they associate with the institution. <coughs> And um, those things are all really important to retention. The second um, um, recommendation I have um, is to globalize the advising system. Um, I can't be surprised to anybody that the research shows first generation students need more advising, academic and other kinds of advising. Um, and they need advising that identify that 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 understands their barriers, and this gets back to identification, right? Um, I've heard I've heard from uh, SSU faculty and, and other advisors, and faculty elsewhere, who um, um, it comes out during an advising session that the student is a first generation student, and and the first generation student starts to describe him, and then the, the advisor now really kind of gets it and really can design the advice such that it really addresses first generation students, yes. I've been thinking this through, you know, as a faculty advisor, I don't know if I'd be comfortable asking them about that. It seems like something they should disclose and so right. I would kind of feel for that or listen for that, but you know, what, what tips do you have for getting to that point? Yeah, and that is a big question. You know, I talked about identification and counting and all that. But, but um, you know, one always has to weigh the benefits against the potential uh, st stigma, I guess, right? Um, I, 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 I do think, um, um, you know, a, a question about uh, family history could, could get into that. Um, and I don't know how many advisors are um, comfortable with that. Um, eliciting that kind of response from students. Um, but, yes, Andre. Yeah. Well, I haven't worked in the advising center, and currently we're there. You know, and Andre, I should say, sorry to interrupt Andre, but Andre is an EOP advisor, and our EOP program um, is students in the EOP program are both first generation and low income students. So Andre has a lot of experience with this. Yeah. And, but also, you know, we're the undeclared advising center, and that's why uh, Obina would pose that question to a student. You know, sometimes it's just the uh, mere uh, inquiry of, of siblings or family. Are, are you the first in your family to attend college? And you'll be surprised how students will begin to open up um, whether or not they've already connected with a, a support group on campus or whether they have, have, have yet to do so. But I, I find that many of the students will uh, be very uh, uh, open and, and, and forthcoming uh, based on the, the, the line of question, or should I say, just the, the, the casual conversation. Um, what they truly want is to know uh, that there is a comfortability in knowing that they, they feel supported. Um, what, I, what I will say on, you know, when you talk about the, uh, you know, emerging or getting the, the, the students to acclimate to the, the campus, the first generation students, yeah. um, I, I have to go with the experience of uh, just this past, uh, I think about three weeks ago, we had Step Africa come to the campus music center. And to hear the performers on stage reference their institution um, and the confidence that they, that they had. But it's it's not like when they were conveying the institu academic institution that they graduated from, there was this um, notion that we here at Sonoma State or in, in the West, 
had similar uh, experience for first generation college students. They, they talked about their uh, uh, relationships to uh, fraternal and soror sorority organizations. And we know here at Sonoma State, huge uh, uh, sorority culture, fraternity culture. But when they were talking to the group, and it was a very diverse crowd there, a number of our first generation students uh, attended the event. And it was somewhat of a, um, why isn't this happening on our campus sort of thing. And I say that, I'm going to say that Cap Alpha Psi on this campus has had a 100% graduation rate, 100%. But as of two months ago, we've now been banned from Sonoma State, or should I say, in fall 2012, there will be a discussion to bring Cap Alpha Psi back to Sonoma State. And Sonoma, uh, Cap Alpha Psi was the first Greek letter organization founded at this university, but has struggled to maintain membership in the excess of just six members. Whereas you look at other organizations on our campus that have 85, 100 plus. And these young men, uh, primarily of African, African descent, I would have to say that the, the rationale or, or the basis was they were on academic probation. That was the, uh, uh, the basis of, of the sanction. But academic probation is not an uncommon thing. And, and again, these young men were not put on campus for hazing, not, put on, not sanctioned for drinking, but the support system, from a cultural standpoint, as they're looking to navigate this new environment and, and looking to each other to, for support and being able to, uh, uh, let's say, from a, a role model or mentoring standpoint, to be introduced to a faculty person, the upperclassmen or the older members of the fraternity help support, provide study groups and things the same. But then we have a, a, a mandate or an institutional um, drive to say, hey, you can't be here anymore. So then in turn, and again, going back to the stuff Africa, when these confident uh, students, and I have to say they were students, students of color, uh, who were proud graduates of their institution, and they, I'm from the real HU, I'm from Texas A&M, I'm from, and, yeah, the, it was amazing to see, but then we also attended the reception. But what, what I listened to was the dialogue between our students and, and the, the visiting students, and the visiting uh, graduates are in awe. You don't, you guys are not here at Sonoma State. They even asked the question from the, from the, uh, uh, the, the stage. And they said, well, how many of you, uh, and it was, it was quiet, it was up, it was down. And they're like, they were trying to figure out what's going on here. And, and so I, 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 I shared it with you and you said as I'm, as I'm hearing and it's, Yes, clearly we want to make sure that the institution as a whole, the powers that be, recognize particular um, uh, mediums, or should I say uh, mechanisms, that support and retain our students. But it, 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 it leaves such a, a, a bitter taste when the students are, are not only trying to engage and be a part of the university, and then when they have something that they feel that they can, can grasp to, then it's pulled from underneath them. To say that, 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 that you're able to come back for 2012, by the time 2012 rolls around, there are no more students that have had the experience at Sonoma State that can tell the new students coming in that, hey, this is a great place. That, hey, you, we can help you achieve your academic goals. And, but, but, and, and so then, retention begins to go out the door. I want to have this particular type of experience. I, I can't drive to Chico all the time. I can't go to Sacramento. And I don't even have a car. Maybe I don't even have a car. So I'd like to create something here. And so, you know, I, I, I hear you, Jeff, and I support wholeheartedly. But it is a matter of identifying how we can empower the students to, to have a voice and say, hey, these are my needs. So when I hear you say, well, how do we, you know, sometimes it really is that simple, just line of question and say, hey, you know, family background. I mean, are you the first in the family? We're proud to have you here, but, you know, what brought you here? This, this is the question. So thanks for just allow me to share it. So one of the things I've, uh, I've heard from you is these other students identified more strongly with their institution than our Sonoma State students did. Yeah, uh, and that is one of the issues that the, the, the Graduation Initiative Committee is, is talking about. There's a variety of ways of doing that. One of the things I'm suggesting here is strong identify, identification with an academic department. And I'm talking about you know, all students everywhere is one way to do that. But another way to do that is through campus organizations and other kinds of things. 
But so yes, couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, um, now, since the research shows that first generation students need more advising, well, what do you do? Well, one of the things you can do is hire more advisors, right? Um, and that's a problem. Um, but not, if you can't hire more advising, and I think I think institutions in this success era now are going to be moving toward this kind of model, then you need to, what I call globalizing the advising system, have more people empowered to do advising. And I know, you know, we have, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to step on, you know, step on people's toes, and, and you, know, this, you know, this is what structural change is all about, unfortunately, and um, suggest that, um, because then, of course there are plenty of people, and I don't want to step on Andre's toes, but there are plenty of people, Andre, who would suggest that um, the only place that students can get advising as undergraduates has to be in the undergraduate advising center. But you, they're fine with you, you know? Um, and so the result of that is we have students graduating from Sonoma State who have seen an advisor, and including department advisor, and this is not any kind of criticism of department advising and faculty advising. They've seen an advisor just a couple times in their whole matriculation, and they, and they graduate. So if we can't get more folks doing advising, then let's go to something else. I was going to say that it's not necessarily that, that faculty aren't there to do advising. It's the students don't maybe have an incentive to come. Absolutely. So maybe if they're, uh, we've actually talked about some things on the Student Affairs Committee about how to improve advising on campus. And sure. So, you know, the ideas of like maybe departments could institute holds so that people have to come in for advising. There's right. a hold on their record. So they can't register until they come see an advisor. And then to promote more students coming in to yes. the offices. Yes. And let me say that you know, we did, we've done a uh, student satisfaction survey the last two years. And one of the results of that survey is that students who receive faculty advising, department advising, are very happy with it. It's good. They like it. Um, and but as you suggest, it's getting them to the advisor. And by the way, um, um, plenty of students avoid it, you know, themselves. Um, and so as you suggest, some way to get them to faculty. That, that's the, um, that, and, uh, at least in terms of first generation students, that's what they need to be successful. They, they need more connection with faculty. They need, um, more advising, um, and, my, and the last um, uh, recommendation in the synthesis of three, I mentioned this before, is more collaborative learning. And again, we've been moving toward this for a while, um, and um, especially for first generation students, because they have this outsider kind of persona, um, they need this you know, so they need to see how other students do things. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I'm the um, supervisor of our tutorial program, and we have a, uh, a, a small uh, supplementary instruction dimension of that program. And, and for those of you that don't know, probably many of you will be very brief. Supplemental instruction is, is, is simply taking some of our high achieving students. Um, and in our case, they've been one-on-one -on -one tutors, and attaching uh, organized study groups to uh, some of our courses. And up to now, it's mainly been the, the, uh, uh, the science departments, biology and chemistry, who really made a good use of this. Um, and the, the tutorial program supplies the, the supplementary instruction leader, who then um, leads these, these two one-hour study sessions um, a week, uh, sometimes one, and we've been doing this for a while now, and I have never been associated with any program on campus where I have never heard a single complaint from any of the student participants. They seem to really crave this and really want it to happen, yes. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I think that's a good point. Um, 
was just going to add on to that. that the way I think you described collaborative learning sounds like it's mostly external to class, but a lot of the literature on collaborative learning also says, you know, you should be doing more of this interaction Very good in point. class. Very and good point. Of, I think that would actually be a nice transfer or connection between the two. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And again, first-generation students are going to benefit more from that. Yes. And especially like when you start it in the class, and then it translates very well out of the class. Like I teach uh, classical sociological theory, and it's a very, I think it's very difficult class for the students. But I spend, um, well, at the beginning of the semester, I launch a poll. How do you study for this class? You know, like oh, I know you all have study skills, but how do you study for this class? But I break them into groups that then the last 10 minutes of class were about twice a week, about two or three weeks leading up to the exam, they break into their groups and they're working on the exam review sheet. And a lot of them take their groups when class ends and move to the library here and keep working on it. Um, and so they've got a supportive structure in them. But it, yeah, because I think it, it then translates. You see, when you say that you break them into groups, do you, do you put them in the groups? Do you say to choose your groups? or? So it's kind of a hybrid between the two. Their groups are based on their presentation groups for the semester, and so it's based on which theorists they're interested in. Um, and so I two groups that present on Marx, two groups that present on Durkheim. And so like, if you and I know we both want to work on Marx and we know each other from another class, we can choose to be in the same group, but there's going to be other students that we don't know in that group too. But they're very small groups. I think the size of groups is really important, yeah. that it's no more than four students. Because once you get, I think, once you get more than four students, you, I don't know. No, I, I, <laughs> yeah, Everyone knows what I'm trying to say, but there's students who don't work as hard. And I, and I totally yeah. agree. Like, like in, in just identifying our internet, there are students that, that don't work as hard. There's also the cultural dynamic from a standpoint of the non, the non first gen, uh, non first generation student based on the familiarity with mm -hmm. other students that, uh, have the entitlement uh, and say, hey, well, how about the three of us are joining group? Mm -hmm. And not only have I had the same experience, but in speaking to my wife in graduate school, I mean, there is still the dynamic that if, in fact, that the instructor is not facilitating and making sure that, hey, we want to, uh, what group are you in? Let's make sure you get in the group, that that need for instructors uh, direct facilitation to make sure that they're, because then it goes back to this uh, studying alone or this, uh, right. you know, yeah. so I just always make a point, even as I'm in the uh, freshman seminar class, and I see those dynamics working out as well, I, I, I make a point to say, hey, you know, we want to get you in a group, we're going to, you know, connect, but make sure that the students are interacting and talking to them as well. I just don't arbitrarily uh, leave it to them to choose because I know that there's still, you know, dynamics there. Yeah. So just a point. Well, it's so interesting to go back and forth on this about, you know, do you totally pick the groups or do you let them totally pick the groups? And in almost all my classes, I've come to this kind of hybrid where I don't want to, because it's like students who are suddenly feeling comfortable, you know, um, and they have one other student they know in the class, it really aids both students learning to work together. But I also want people to get to know each other. But I do, in, in a lot of my classes, have these sort of semi structured groups that are formed usually the second week of classes, and then they do what, they stick with the same four students throughout the semester, working on something, but then they also end up working on test material and stuff, too. Okay, I was going to, and I know we're at the end, I just have a quick question for yeah. you. And I understand the desire to immerse students early in majors, but I guess my question to you is, what happens if you're asking students too quickly to decide on majors? Because the natural inclination is to go with what you're familiar with, right? So yeah. I've heard psychology, I've heard business, but it leads to that on all these other things. Yeah, I know that that's the hard choice. You know, that's the balance. You know, and um, and my 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 recommendation uh, to to and really for Sonoma State to move into uh, the beginning of the sophomore year, really Heather is is born from looking at the, the retention statistics and being willing to accept that problem. Yes, you have to, but by the way, you have to allow students to change their major. No, I'm not saying they're locked in at that point. But, but yeah, yeah, you know, the, there's no easy way to make that choice. 
And if you are going to make the argument, but I, I did a little research into the uh, Australian system, by the way, yeah. and I found out, I, I was surprised to see this, that Australian students, they make their major selection in their post-secondary application. And that, that, uh, that selection is then determines what campus they go to, right? There are campus, the, the, I mean, many campuses have multiple disciplines, but some, some are, are um, more oriented toward engineering or whatever. And, you know, we have that too. And the, the, those, that student is then moves to that, um, to that campus. So um, I, I, many of us would say, well, that's too early. You know, before they even get there, you're requiring them to choose their major. Um, but on the other hand, what, what was sometimes called the, the liberal arts model, you know, where, where students come in there, they're exposed to this short sport of ideas, and then they will choose. Um, I'm afraid that, um, let's say, if we allowed our students to choose a major only at the beginning of their um, senior year, let's say, um, a lot of students who are deferring, and the research actually shows this, they're not doing it because they are, they are kind of choosing stuff. They're doing it because they're disconnected and they and they're the ones who drop out. John? I think that model can work. The, the late choice can work if you have really intensive advising. That is, in a, like in these some of the small private liberal arts institutions where each advisor has maybe 12 students or 15 <laughs> students, um, and, 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 and that they're required to see the advisor before registering for classes, and the advisor's always there and available. Uh, Very I mean, good point. I mean, just one, of, one of the issues here at a public institution like this is um, the very students who are most in need, in need of advising are probably the ones who are least likely to go and seek it out Absolutely. because they don't have that, what's your term, the, uh, you know, the sense of uh, the, uh, the, the, it's the intuitive orientation. Yes. So, I mean, it, it, so, I mean, I think that I really would love it if they could declare later, but I'm realizing given the workloads that five advisors have for all the undeclareds, Absolutely. Can I just ask a quick question? Here's what I'm wondering about. So imagine you are in a discipline, which I actually am not, that most people haven't heard of. Right. I, I, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. So we yeah. have this problem where everybody comes having taken a science class and right. they're like, let's keep going. Right. But I, <laughs> what, is that, what does that department do? Exactly. And there are some people who may start, who may choose something because they've got to choose something. And exactly. Yeah, they do change, but then they end up being here five years right. or six years, and then there's yeah. As well. Yeah. That's the, what do they call it? Devil's choice. Yeah. yeah. Worse, I mean, yeah. And you can't take them off. No, that's right. <laughs> we really <laughs> like them to find some new places. Yeah. Well, at my undergrad institution, you had you picked a school, yeah. um, and you so your freshman year you got advised at the university level, and then by the beginning of your sophomore year, you picked the School of Social Sciences or Science and Technology or Humanities, um, and then you got advised your sophomore year about your school level stuff, and then you picked your major and started your junior year. And so then you could explore, you know, that in sociology you get a lot of people who get turned down by the psych department, and they're like, well, I've never taken a social class. And we start talking career goals with them, and so it's actually a really good to better. Yeah, yeah, or, you know, people take a psych class in high school and keep going in it, but for career-wise, there might be a slightly better fit. Yeah, that's, it's just, yeah, no, it's here. Yeah. Oh, 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 y